be thy name. You know, there, there's something about a name. You know, you guys have all been given a name, and there's meaning, and there's significance in that. Um, and, and so we want to talk about God's name and how we properly use that, uh, especially in our prayers and our praise. And you're, you're going to see throughout worship today, we're going to be dropping God's name all the time. Uh, and, and we'd love for you guys to drop your names to each other as well. So let's stand, let's welcome each other to worship. Greet one another by name as you know each other. If you don't know someone's name, introduce yourselves and then we'll stay standing as we sing. Holy, holy. and majesty are before him. 
how we're supposed to live our lives. That's how we want to live our lives, knowing that we carry the name of God around with us, and yet we fall short of that. And so what does God do? He continues to place his name on us. He continues to speak his name over us. As we gather for worship, we hear the name of Jesus. And what does the name of Jesus mean? It means the Lord saves. And so you're invited to look away from your sin, which cannot save you, which in fact condemns you. And you're to look to Jesus, the one who has saved you, the one who continues to save you. So I announce the grace of God to you today in the name of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated as we join in singing, praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
but you'll speak the yellow portions today. So we say together, Hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. How is God's name kept holy? God's name reflection of some of the petitions that he gives to his disciples. So as we talk about God's name being made holy or sanctified, you're, you're going to see some of that language reflected here in John chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence, that the glory I had with you before the world began. And then down to verse 17, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Our sermon hymn this morning uh, is a creedal hymn out of our hymnal, and so in the place of confessing the words of one of our historic creeds, we're going to sing these words together. Holy God, we praise thy name.
Let's pray. Oh, Father, so often, even when we show up for church, somehow it's about us. It's about what we want to get out of this time, and yet, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And so may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight, for you alone are holy. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So can I ask you a really personal question this weekend? What is the biggest prayer that you're praying right now? And I'm not just saying, like, I'm praying that the rain would stop. Yes, a lot of us are praying that, but I'm, I'm saying, like, what is the biggest prayer that you are praying right now? Like, that ache deep down in your heart, that longing for something to be a reality that is currently not a reality in your life. What is the biggest prayer that you're praying? You know, I know it. Some of you, you're praying really, really big prayers. Like as a parent right now, you are praying for discernment when it comes to what to do in a, in a tough situation with one of your children. Some of you, you have a friend or a family member who is dealing with a mental health challenge, and like that is your biggest prayer right now. Some of you, it, it, it's physical health, and, and there's a setback that you or a loved one is experiencing, and, and it's just not getting any better. And some of you, it, it's a marriage. It's, it, it's just hanging on by a thread. And those are really, really big, gut-wrenching, deep prayers. In the summer, we're doing a teaching series through a really, really big prayer called the Lord's Prayer. It's actually not that big. It's only 70 words for us to say. And yet, there is so much in every single one of these petitions And I want to talk with you this weekend about what I think is the biggest prayer of the entire Lord's Prayer. And it's the very first petition. And as we take a look at this, I believe that that the words of the very first petition of the Lord's Prayer put all of the other big prayers that we are praying in perspective. And what are those words? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. But can I be honest with you this weekend? For most of my life, I haven't really understood these words. And so when it comes to praying the Lord's Prayer, I, I, I say these words, but I kind of just skip right over them because they're, they're confusing to me. And maybe they've been confusing to you as well because it uses language that we don't typically use. Like hallowed, like who talks that way? I don't use that language. We don't use that language in our culture. What does it mean for something to be hallowed? I remember when I was in high school and I had the opportunity to travel to Gettysburg, to the historic site of that bloody battle, yet that decisive battle that happened during the Civil War. I remember walking around on the battlefield and the fog was rolling in and, and there was just this sense of, eeriness that hovered over that ground. And and then our guide brought us all together and he read words from the Gettysburg Address. Words that President Abraham Lincoln had given just a few weeks later on that same battleground. He said this, We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who have struggled here, have hallowed it far above our ability to add or detract. There's that word. Hallowed. And what does it mean? It means that there is something sacred that has happened there on that ground. Something significant happened. Blood was shed. Lives were lost. And Lincoln recognized, like, I can't do anything to hallow this ground. It's already hallowed by the lives of the men who fought and lost their lives. But in this moment, I can recognize 
that hallowedness. I can recognize the sacred seriousness of this moment. Something big, something significant happened here. And that's what we're praying in the Lord's Prayer. Not praying for a hallowed place, but we're praying about a person. Hallowed be thy name. Which, if I'm going to put that petition in my own words, I'd put it this way. God, help us to take you more seriously in our life. God, help me to wake up today with an awareness of your presence. God, help me as I go about my everyday tasks and the responsibilities that have been given to me. Help me to give honor to you. God, help me to make your name great in me and through me so that others can give you the glory. Hallowed be your name. And that, that's a really big prayer. And here's the thing about this prayer. It's not about me. But how often are our prayers about us? Even those big prayers that you're praying right now. So often our prayers are about us. But you look at the Lord's Prayer, and it puts everything in proper perspective. From the very beginning, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then how does the prayer end? For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. From beginning to end, the Lord's Prayer reminds us that it's not about me. It's about God. But so often, th th this is what we do. We, we turn prayer into something that's all about us. And so when it comes to our name, we want our name to be great. We want people to recognize us. We want people to give honor to us. And this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel, where they build that ancient skyscraper to the heavens. For what reason? To make a name for themselves. It's about their fame. It's about their renown reverberating throughout the entire creation. And still to this day, like this is what we do. We want to be famous. Like whether on a small scale level or a large scale level, we want people, when they hear our name, to think positively about us. To think, oh, they're a, they're a great person. They're a, a great mom. They're a great student. They're a great worker. They're a great coach. They're a great athlete. They're a great singer. We want people to recognize us and give honor to us. But that's not what this petition is about. It's not about me. It's about God. And so the psalmist in Psalm 115 gets it right. Not to us, O Lord. Not to us. But to your name be the glory. It's about his name, his fame, his renown reverberating throughout the entire world. It's not about the name of Donald Trump or Taylor Swift. It's not about the name of Victor Wembenyama or Elon Musk. It is not about the name of Oprah Winfrey or one of the Kardashians. It's not about your name, and it's not about my name. It's about one name, the name that is above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's about the name of Jesus. That's what we're praying for in this petition. And just stop for a moment and envision that. The name of Jesus on the lips of all people. That's a really big prayer. And that's what this petition is. God, help my heart and the hearts of all people to reverence you, to esteem you, to honor you, to cherish you, to treasure you. God, may you be bigger and may you be smaller. Hallowed be your name. So how do we do that? How do we do that in our everyday lives? How
how do we hallow God's name? I want to give you four very simple, very practical ways that you can begin to do this, starting here today in your life. And the first is this. Drop it frequently. You know anybody who's a name dropper? Like, they, they just have this way of dropping the names of people into conversation. Like, people who have some level of fame or their name is familiar. This is what we're supposed to do with the name of God. We're to bring it up in conversation. And here's the thing. Familiarity breeds frequency. In other words, those that we know the best, we talk about the most. Those that we are closest to. This is why parents, grandparents, we talk about our kids. We talk about our grandkids. Why? Because those are the people that we know the best. And so we're just constantly dropping their name into conversation. Why? Because familiarity breeds frequency. And so the goal is that we have such a close relationship with God that we can't help but drop his name into conversation. But here we have to be careful. Because there's a right way and there's a wrong way that you can refer to the name of God. So I heard recently about a little two-year-old girl. Her favorite word right now is Jesus. And you're like, oh, that is so sweet. Until you hear how she uses it. Every time she gets frustrated, she drops the name of Jesus. Why? Because that's how she hears the name of Jesus spoken in her home. And that is not a way to hallow God's name. In fact, here's what I'd say. If you find yourself hollering God's name, you are likely not hallowing God's name. You're probably hollowing his name. You're emptying it. You're desecrating it. You're using it in an inappropriate way. And this is where the second commandment comes into play. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Do not take the name of the Lord your God. So either you drop it properly, or, and some of you, this is a place where you're at in life because you have dropped the name of Jesus inappropriately. And if you can't drop it properly, then there may be needs to be a chunk of time where you drop it altogether. Just don't use the name until you learn how to use it properly. So that's the first way that we hallow God's name, is we drop it frequently. Secondly, then, we sing it loudly. And this is probably one of the one of the simplest ways that we can drop the name of God is just in the music that we sing. And, and the Psalms do this all the time. Like we did this this morning as we used the words of Psalm 96. And let me just refer back to these for a moment. Sing praise to the Lord. Praise his name. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. What's he doing? He's dropping the name of God over and over and over again. And our hymnals do the very same thing. You can grab your hymnal this morning. You can open it up. You can page through it. And him after him after him will mention the names of God. And so this is what we are to do. We are to sing God's praises. In fact, I, I think this is, this is something that we often forget about when it comes to how we pray. That one of the simplest and best ways that we can pray is simply to sing. When you don't have the words to say, just start singing. And, and don't sing lethargically, just mumbling out the words. No, sing it loudly. And I know you got a voice. You might not always use it here, but I've been at community events. I know you have a voice. Use it. Use it to sing God's praises. That's the second way that we hallow his name, is we sing it loudly. Then, number three, we preach it purely. And this is what Luther gets at in his explanation in the small catechism. He says, how is God's name hallowed? When the word of God is taught in its truth, 
God's word is a representation of his reputation. It's a collective explanation of who he is and what he's done. And if we take all of those words that we've, he said and we misinterpret them, then we've maligned his reputation. And I think this is one of the biggest blasphemies against the name of God. Is churches and pastors who have taken God's word and have made it say something that it doesn't say. We need to have God's news. My responsibility as a pastor to you is to preach it purely. Because I believe if we fail to know the scriptures in their fullness, there's a lot in it. If we fail to know these scriptures in their fullness, then we fail to fully know God. So that's the third way that we hallow God's name. We preach it purely. And then finally, number four, we bear it proudly. And this one is so critical because the gospel is wrapped up in this. You receive God's name when you are baptized. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that changes you. Because on our own, we can't hallow God's name. We are unholy people. And maybe you've been convicted already here this morning. You're like, yeah, I haven't hallowed God's name. Yeah, on our own. We cannot hallow God's name. And so what does God do? God sent his son as the holy one to live a holy, perfect life that you and I could not live. To die a death that you and I deserved. Jesus shed his blood on hallowed ground. Not at a on the ground of Gettysburg, but on the ground of Golgotha. In order to hallow not only that ground, but in order to hallow your soul. Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, you were washed, you were made holy, you were hallowed, some translations say. You were made right with God. And all of this was done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit of our God. And if you read the entirety of the context here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you see that it changes us. That we have been made holy by a holy God. And so now we live holy lives. And this is why Luther adds to the question, how is God's name hallowed? Not only when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, but then it's followed up with, and we as the children of God also lead holy lives according to it. So how do we hallow God's name? We drop it frequently, we sing it loudly, we preach it purely, and we bear it proudly. And that's a really big prayer. It's basically saying, God, before I, before I approach you with any other prayers, God, I want you to be the biggest thing in my life. And I want everybody else around me to see how big you are. I want people everywhere to know you and to take you seriously. I want your name to be dropped in conversation after conversation after conversation. I want your holy word to be heard. I want people to sing your praises. I want your holiness to permeate every human heart. And when you begin to pray that way... changes every prayer that you pray. Even the biggest prayers, those aches, those longings in your heart, it takes all of those problems and it puts them in proper perspective. We have a big God who can handle your biggest prayer. So may our biggest prayer this week simply be our Father in heaven, hallowed to come forward at this time then as we receive our offering.
once again receive his holiness, his holy blood, his holy body for you so that you can continue to hallow his name. So um, as we receive communion today, the ushers will come forward from the center aisle. Uh, They'll invite you to form two lines. Uh, You'll receive the bread from us as a pastoral team, the wine will be placed on the tables in front of you, and then there are baskets where you can discard your empty cup. So uh, let's prepare for communion.
So the traditional words of blessing that we use in worship there are found in Numbers chapter 6, and it's preceded as God tells Aaron, who's the high priest of that time, take my name and put it on the people. Our worship from beginning to end is wrapped up in the name, the name in which you were baptized, and now the name that you continue to go out and bear as you hallow his name. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you now and always his peace. Amen. We'll sing our closing hymn.